In this section, we're going to look at molecular orbital theory. One of the limitations of Lewis theory it does, is it doesn't predict some of the behaviors of atoms. So if we look at oxygen here, we find that oxygen is magnetic. And here's some liquid oxygen stuck between two magnets. So that means that oxygen is paramagnetic. However, if we look at the Lewis structure, there's two electrons here and two 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 here. They're all paired. So why is oxygen magnetic if all the electrons are paired? And we'll explain that at the end of this discussion. But the point is that Lewis theory is missing some things. And we're going to look at one of the simplest forms of molecular orbital theory. And one of those, this form basically means that um, electrons are acting like waves. And we have these two things that happen when we combine these waves. We have regions where we have constructive interference. Remember that constructive interference of one wave and another doubles the amplitude of the wave. The wavelengths mass drop. The crests are with the crests, the troughs are with the troughs, and when you combine them together, you double the amplitude. That's like a bonding orbital. Then we have the opposite case where the crests and the troughs line up and you get destructive interference. And that's like the antibonding orbital. So when these two orbitals overlap, we have two atomic orbitals. They combine to form two molecular orbitals. One molecular orbital is bonding and the other molecular orbital is antibonding. Or said another way, regions of constructive interference and regions of destructive interference. If we look at it another way, these two orbitals combine constructively to form a sigma bond. These two orbitals um, interact destructively in order to form an antibond. Whenever two orbitals overlap, you're going to have a total of two orbitals. One is going to be bonding and one is going to be antibonding. The bonding one is going to decrease in energy, and the antibonding one is going to increase in energy as compared to the atomic orbital. How about in the case of a pi bond? In the pi bond, it's the same thing. You're going to have regions of destructive interference here, where you have an antibonding orbital, and there's no electron density between the atoms, and regions of constructive interference, where the amplitude, again, is constructively interfering where you have an actual bond. So here you're combining two on hybridized p orbitals and you're getting two atomic orbitals, or excuse me, two molecular orbitals, a bonding one and an antibonding one. So let's take a look at how this works in actual atoms. Unfortunately, um, this essentially comes down to memorization. And we want to look at two examples. We're going to look at H2 and HE2 as the two examples that we're going to look at here. Then finally, we're going to look at oxygen, and that will be the last thing we look at in this chapter. So if we have 1H on this side and 1H on this side, H has a 1S electron, and this H has a 1S. For hydrogen, it's 1S1, so there's two electrons. When we combine these two hydrogens, there's going to be regions of constructive interference. This is the sigma 1s, constructively interfering, a bond. And regions of destructive interference, the sigma 1s star, the antibond. So we started with two atomic orbitals, two atomic orbitals, and we formed two molecular orbitals. One where there's constructive interference, the sigma bonding orbital, and one where there's destructive interference, the sigma antibonding orbital. We now have two electrons to place. Well, if we start with two electrons, we put in two electrons. Now we can calculate what's called the bond order. And the bond order is, well, I guess we could do it equals to, it's the bonding electrons minus the antibonding electrons divided by two. So in this case, it's two bonding electrons minus zero antibonding electrons 
divided by 2, which equals 1. So this means that we would predict a single bond between two hydrogens, which is exactly what we have. This is the Lewis structure of hydrogen. Let's look at helium. Helium is the same thing. It only has 1s electrons, except helium is 1s2. So it has two, um, I don't know why I pulled that so far over, it has two electrons in its 1s orbital. If we were to overlap them, the two atomic orbitals shall form two molecular orbitals. We have the sigma 1s and the sigma star 1s. We're now going to fill in the four electrons. One, two, three, four. Now that we've filled in the four electrons, we can calculate the bond order. Well, the bonding electrons are two. The anti-bonding electrons are also two. Divided by two. Two minus two is, of course, zero. Zero divided by two is zero. This predicts that heliums will not form a bond with each other. So one helium will not bond with another helium because the bond order is zero. So that's how it works for very small molecules like hydrogen and helium. Now let's look at something with bigger molecules like um, period two elements. So here you can see what happens when you mix lithium, beryllium, boron, so on and so forth. And the interesting thing to note is that the pi orbitals for everything up to nitrogen are lower in energy than the sigma orbitals for whatever reason. But when we get to oxygen, fluorine, and neon, the sigma 2p is lower in energy than the pi 2p, which means the order of the orbitals is going to be different. For everything up to nitrogen, the order is sigma 2s, sigma star 2s, pi 2p, pi, uh, sigma 2p, and everything after oxygen is sigma 2s, pi 2, is sigma star 2s, sigma 2p, pi 2p. So the order here has flipped. We're going to look at oxygen, so we want to use this order. So let me show you how this works. So for oxygen, O2, we're going to have one oxygen. I'm going to draw it a little bit lower. One oxygen and another oxygen. And what we're going to have is the 2s electrons. We're only going to do the valence electrons. The 2s electrons and the 2p electrons, like this. Now, when we have these uh, sets of electrons, I'm going to draw these a little bit over here, just so it's a little bit nicer. So when we draw these electrons for the atomic orbitals, well, oxygen has its 2s2, 2p4, 1, 2, 3, 4. And this oxygen has an electron configuration, 2s2, 2p4, because it's the same. It's also oxygen. I am now going to combine these orbitals. When I combine the 2s, I'm going to form a sigma 2s, lower in energy, bonding, and a sigma star 2s, higher in energy, anti-bonding. This is just like the examples with hydrogen and helium. The s orbitals formed a sigma and a sigma star. Constructive interference, destructive interference, bonding, anti-bonding. The two p's interact differently. When the two p's form together, you end up with sigma orbitals and pi orbitals. In the case of oxygen, the two p, the excuse me, the sigma two p is the lowest in energy. If it were nitrogen, the pi two p would be lower. Then we have two orbitals for the pi 2p bonding. Now that we've formed this, we need to find the, form the antibonding orbitals. And the pi star 2p, our next lowest in energy, followed by the sigma star 2p. So this is the order of the orbitals. If we look back over to the lecture slides, it's sigma 2s, sigma star 2s, sorry, it's this one, sigma 2s, sigma star 2s, sigma 2p, pi 2p, and there's two of them, 
pi star 2p, sigma 2p, which is the exact same order that we have here. Unfortunately, you do essentially have to memorize the order of these things. So let's look at what we did. We combined 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 atomic orbitals, which we means we need 8 molecular orbitals. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Half of the molecular orbitals are bonding, regions of constructive interference, and half the molecular orbitals are antibonding, or starred, regions of destructive interference. Now that we've added, to, um, or figured out what the orbitals, the molecular orbitals are, all we have to do is add in the electrons. Well, how many do we have to add? 2, 4, 5, 6, 8, 10, 11, 12. So there are 2, 4, 5, 6 from this oxygen and 6 from this oxygen for a total of 12. Let's do that. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. What do you notice? Well, what I notice is that these two electrons are unpaired, which means that this species is paramagnetic. And this explains why it's attracted to a magnet, that very powerful magnet with the liquid oxygen at the beginning of the lecture notes, because there are unpaired electrons. Let's look at the bond order. The bond order is the bonding electrons minus the antibonding electrons divided by two. So how many do we have in the bonding? Two, four, six, eight. So we have eight electrons in bonding orbitals. How many do we have in antibonding? Two, three, four. And we want to divide that by two. So we get two. If we look at the Lewis structure of oxygen, we have a double bond. However, the Lewis structure does not predict that this is paramagnetic, has unpaired electrons. Remember, paramagnetic means has unpaired electrons, and diamagnetic means has no unpaired electrons. The Lewis structure does not predict that this is paramagnetic. However, molecular orbital theory does. If we look at these two examples, helium won't form because the bonding and the antibonding are the same, but it would be, if it did form, uh, diamagnetic because they're all paired, and hydrogen is also diamagnetic. But it can predict that oxygen is paramagnetic and has a bond order of two. So this has been... Um, molecular orbital theory. Again, I understand that in this course you essentially have to memorize this diagram and then plug in um, the electrons.